Presented by Caltech. It's a great pleasure to introduce our next short course presenter, David Nealon, who after obtaining a PhD from Princeton University in 1987, has been a professor in the UCLA Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences for 25 or so years. And if I enumerated all of his honors and awards, he wouldn't have enough time to give his presentation. AMS fellow, AGU fellow, Guggenheim fellow. Um, really excited to have him present uh, an overview on the really influential research that he's done about the hydrological cycle, how it changes uh, under anthropogenic and other perturbations. Okay, thank you. I'm going to um, start with uh, a review of some basics, including some things on the moist static energy budget, uh, which Bill introduced earlier, and a reminder of a few things about the uh, conditions for onset of precipitation and how these tend to get forgotten in some of the simplest explanations for precipitation change under global warming. Um, I also hope to set the stage a little bit for uh, dialogue with a talk by Shang Ping Xie um, later on this afternoon. And uh, some statements about robust change of hydrological cycle and the fact that those are strongly scale dependent uh, time and space. Um, and so I'm going to at the end touch on uh, model disagreement uh, and the sensitivity, how, how this sensitivity might arise. Um, I apologize at the start, there will be some equations, uh, but they'll be iterated and I'll be using them to, as launching pads to talk about some of the physical effects and that will connect into some of the uses of the moist static energy equation for the um, uh, monsoon studies. So uh, a brief summary of uh, uh, some of the pieces that go into setting the convection zones uh, as viewed through the lens of theoretical work uh, over um, multiple years. Uh, one of the factors is that you have many fast time scales going on. One of the fast time scales is that of conditional instability. Um, Further plug. Okay. Um, so uh, fast time scales, conditional instability, onset of deep convection, uh, parameterized in many climate models as one of the fastest time scales um, through convective quasi equilibrium, uh, establishing a temperature profile in a convecting region that is related to the boundary layer on the one hand and whatever gets entrained in the lower free troposphere, which is actually a very important uh, dependence uh, uh, um, through the moistening of the lower free tro troposphere that that requires. Another fast time scale is that of gravity wave dynamics in the tropics tending to iron out the pressure and temperature gradients. Um, this is something, uh, an approximation that's been used since uh, 1987 in modeling eventually became known as the weak temperature gradient approximation or the weak pressure gradient approximation depending on which flavor you like best. Uh, you then have radiative cooling that's uh, going on in slower time scales. And um, as you, uh, once you get the convection going, you have a uh, moisture convergence being very important in maintaining this. And this has become one of the basics uh, perturbing the moisture equation of the way we tend to talk about changes under global warming, but it's far, far from the full picture. However, it's worth remembering that this moist convergence is doing something important, which is if you have a region that is slightly favorable to convection, for instance, as Bill was pointing out, if it has high low level moist static energy, um, relative to a neighboring region, then this region gets all the moisture you're evaporating over here and bringing it in and converging it here. So there's a rich get richer type effect in the normal climate. 
And then the surface fluxes interact with the boundary layer rather quickly, uh, so you have multiple competing effects going on in here. And then the question is for the problem that you're uh, addressing, what approximations can you make, what simplifications that can you make uh, to uh, help sort these things out more simply. Now, let's start with something that is relatively uh, simple, the closest Clapeyron equation here as quantified in a paper by O'Gorman and Muller. Um, the rule of thumb is 7-ish uh, percent increase in moisture, say, uh, globally or tropically or tropospherically integrated per degree Celsius of warming. And if you just eyeball a couple of things on this plot, which is a function of latitude showing the percent change per degree of warming uh, from a set of climate models, uh, if you make a relative, uh, constant relative humidity assumption, you get this type of curve here, which does have some latitude dependence, but here's the canonical 7% number over here. And then you get some reductions relative to that in the subtropics uh, and some increases relative to that in some of the regions of strong moisture convergence. But that's used often as a, a rule of thumb. So that's one of the things that's relatively simple. Now, just to touch base on from every climate model, you have this primitive equation, uh, temperature or thermodynamic equation, and a moisture equation here. Um, the Q is the specific humidity, which will sometimes be vertically integrated. T, temperature. S is the dry static energy that was introduced by uh, Bill uh, earlier on. And uh, I'm uh, setting units like latent heat and uh, the uh, heat capacity to uh, unity in some of these expressions. So main thing is, if you vertically integrate these and add them, your moisture loss cancels with your convective heating. And you end up with an equation, the more vertically integrated moist static energy equation, that has much more subtle balances. There's a net energy flux into col the column from top and bottom of all forms of energy, radiative and latent, as well as sensible a little bit at the surface. The moist static energy H is being transported strongly by the um, uh, vertical velocity omega in pressure coordinates here, and then you have some gradients being dragged around as well. Um, when you look at the uh, equation in this form, you've canceled what appear to be the very large terms of convective heating and moisture sink in this equation. And one of the implications of this is, first of all, if you define an effective static stability of the flow, uh, gross moist stability, it's much, much smaller than the dry stability because there's large cancellation between the convective heating and the adiabatic cooling. And furthermore, small changes in the net energy flux uh, can lead to char large necessary changes in the transports because you have a very finely tuned balance here. Now, a couple more slides. This is the moisture balance for perturbations. And this perturbation here, uh, the P prime, will be the change in precipitation under global warming for the, uh, most of the effects we're talking about here. You have an easy change, which is the increase of moisture times the mean convergence, as it commonly gets talked about in diagnostics of the moisture equation. And then you have a nasty term, as it turns out over here, which is the change in the moisture convergence or other aspects of the flow. There's a dot, dot, dot over here, which would include transient aspects, plus some advection when you generate gradients. So some of the basics at the very uh, simplest level. Uh, at the global scale, you're integrating up, so the transports tend to cancel out, and you have precipitation approximately bal um, balancing evaporation. That's set by surface energy balance. That's only increasing at about 2% per degree Kelvin increase in global warming, as has been known for quite some time. Um, and uh, so the large scale precipitation isn't changing that much. When you get to increasing the temperatures, uh, one of the effects is that you've increased the moisture according, according to the closest Clapeyron that we've just seen. So one of the temptations is to argue that, okay, if you have a region that has moisture convergence, you should get more convergence into it. And this uh, uh, has come to be sometimes known as the wet get wetter, uh, sometimes as the rich get richer, in the sense that regions that are already favorable convection are getting even more associated with the increase of moisture. And at mid-latitudes, regions that are favorable for mid-latitude storms are getting increased uh, moisture supply. 
And I will come back to several uh, details on this because for one thing, this is omitting, when you do it just from the uh, moisture budget, all the things about the energy budget and the onset of convection, all these other things that you should be considering into the mix as well. And you can try to cut these different ways. For instance, the uh, warm get wetter, which Shang Ping, I think, will be talking about this afternoon. I assume that's correct. Huh? So variants on these uh, ingredients are going to lead to slightly different ways of looking at the elephant. Um, let's do the moist static energy budget for perturbations. And there's some details down here about how you define a gross moist stability, but the important part of it is that it's an effective static stability that includes the partial cancellation by moisture transport of whatever work you did to raise a large scale parcel. So you're wrapping this all into this gross moist stability M here. And you're gonna have a mean value here times the perturbation of the uh, convergence and you can add transients to this if you care to at the expense of some extra complication. But this is the term that was the wild card in the previous equation, the change in the circulation, sometimes referred to as the dynamical uh, contributions or also the convergence feedback if you're being more specific. You can have changes in several of these terms contributing to driving these dynamical effects and I'll come back to these one at a time. Now, this top part of this slide is going to repeat again. Uh, you've seen it before, and I'll just mention the association of each of these with effects that we see and are talked about uh, within the literature. So this is repeating this, the uh, moisture budget I just uh, showed you, um, where we have this wet get wetter, rich get richer, warm get wetter. I just put X get Xer, and then we can fight about which it is uh, <laughs> later on, because they're really flavors of the same thing with some pluses and minuses. Um, so the atmospheric energy budget that we saw is gonna put some constraints on what type of convergent transports you can have. Although, as Bill pointed out, this is diagnostic. And there's some serious issues that the moist static energy equation, if you're in a situation where the moisture at low levels and the temperature through the column are tightly tied together, in a convective region, the moist static energy equation is the equation that governs most of the dynamics. But as soon as you stop convecting, the moisture equation and the temperature equation, the thermodynamic equation, split from each other. And so you have this uneasy transition between when you start convecting and when you don't, where you've got a different number of leading order equations governing the flow. Now, a couple of things that are gonna make life easy. Um, uh, some details, Jajo and I uh, put together this in 2004, and Isaac Held and Brian Soden had the brilliant idea of simplifying everything by throwing away all of the nasty convergent terms that require uh, all the song and dance about the uh, thermodynamic equation and the onset and so on. Interestingly, pragmatically, if you average over many models that disagree highly with each other, or you average over large spatial scales, you can pretty much kill this convergent term, averaging over a large enough region that the, um, the, the, uh, the divergence uh, cancels over the region or becomes negligible. And so at regional scales, these uh, convergence feedbacks or dynamical contributions are a major factor in the uncertainty, as we will see at the end of the talk. Uh, and whereas at large scales, the scale of the Hadley circulation, the subtropics versus the deep tropics in mid latitudes, you can get away with dropping this stuff or averaging it away and working from this more or less with some caveats to be thrown in. So here's um, some of the stuff from uh, Held and Soden um, where you're doing a, uh, a, a, what's become called as the thermodynamic component. When Jia and I were working on this, we called it the direct moisture effect, but the thermodynamic component has caught on, so that's what it uh, currently is. Um, now, oddly, if you're thinking about using the thermodynamic equation, you would never ever call this the thermodynamic uh, uh, component because it's what you get if you pretend there is no thermodynamic equation governing atmospheric motions. So it's sort of the anti-thermodynamic component. Um, but uh, terminology is what it is. Um, so uh, all you're taking is this canonical 7% increase per degree Celsius. 
um, taking the uh, moisture convergence as diagnosed from precipitation minus evaporation, multiplying it together to get an estimate of your um, potential precipitation minus evaporation change. And it's nice and smooth and it looks exactly like the climatology of precipitation minus evaporation here, where you're exporting moisture from the subtropics and importing it into the deep tropics in the uh, convergence zones and to mid latitudes in the regions where you've got uh, vericlinic instability driving your storm track. Now, if you compare this to a large ensemble of models averaged together for the annual average, you get what, if you blur your eyes or take off your glasses, looks like pretty good agreement. If you toggle back and forth, you can see some obvious disagreement. And uh, if you do a scatter plot for either a multi-model ensemble uh, average or a single model, uh, you quickly notice that there's some significant uh, departures from this. But this has sort of entered the lexicon as a simple way uh, to talk about things. And I should, I mentioned that uh, earlier on the slides that they're talking about increased moisture and change in the moisture convergence. Um, there are antecedents, go, antecedents going back to Manabi and Stauffer and Manabi and Weatherald in 1980. So it's, it's a long, long standing way of discussing things. Now, if you're at the large scale, so for instance, you're looking at salinity changes that tend to integrate over time and integrate over gyres, then at these large scales, this rich get richer mechanism uh, works pretty well. Uh, and uh, um, this is from a, a study by Dirac et al. in 2012. So that's all very good. And it gives you a simple way of expressing things. And it gives you a way of talking about what happens in the subtropics by and large versus deep tropics and mid-latitudes. Let's diagram it and put some of the other ingredients into what's going on here because moisture convergence is all very well, but you've got to do other stuff. You've got to meet an energy budget and you've got to get your convection to convect, right? So in your convective region, let's say you warm your troposphere, which is essentially the leading effect that happens due to the uh, increase in greenhouse gases. Uh, your if you did that suddenly, your convection would shut down for a moment and then you'd uh, moisten up and increase your moist static energy in the boundary layer, just like Bill was talking about, until you were again able to get conditional instability again, and then your convection would proceed with a higher level of moisture, thus increasing the moisture convergence, and you would hope that we'd have even more convection there. However, notice that it's subject to those uh, extra statements about energy budget you still have to uh, satisfy all the balances. And if you have more moisture, you can easily have more gradients relative to the uh, slightly drier uh, subtropics, and you're gonna be moving that around. And furthermore, not all regions are going to be so easily able to meet the new convective criterion. And that's going to depend on such things as what the background SST is. So um, let's throw a couple of other things into the loop here. One talks sometimes about the slowdown of the tropical circulation. Um, if you look at this term here, the perturbation of the gross moist ability, if you either change the lapse rate, which you do, if you're at a, on a new moist adiabat, you've slightly shifted the dry static energy throughout the uh, uh, troposphere, or if you're in training, you have a slightly different relationship as well. Um, uh, and then furthermore, your convection tends to go higher. Both those effects will tend to increase the dry static contribution to this. If it's sufficient compared to the moisture increase, you can actually yield reduced convergences in some places and shut down the, the uh, reduce the strength of the circulation uh, locally, uh, this term having to be balanced by uh, the convergence, the dynamical response over here. Or, if you've increased a gradient between your uh, subtropics and your now greatly moistened uh, um, convection zone, you can import slightly less increased moist static energy air from the non-convective regions and reach the convective onset criterion less often. This is sometimes referred to as the opt-ante mechanism or um, convective margin theory. And uh, it's also worth noting that you can run this out from the um, thermodynamic equation as well. You can say, well, over large scales, I need to balance my radiative heating and my convective heating. Therefore, my mass flux must decrease. That holds over sufficiently large averages. So you can actually meet that type of balance with local reduction from either of these terms at a regional scale. 
And here's an example of this um, from a, a paper by Hui Su uh, came out recently. The paper's largely about cloud effects. So notice that there's a, uh, um, a, a cloud change part of the panel being covered up down here in order to just to talk about the circulation of the Hadley cell. And this gives a good excuse to point out a couple of things that are, are common. If you average over the upward branch, it might well be uh, reduced, but it can go with uh, increased, remember negative in pressure velocity is upward motion. It can have increased upward motion in the core and reductions at the flanks. That's this, tends to be from this upped anti-mechanism. At the same time, it's broadening out and that's been extensively discussed and has implications, for instance, for the um, uh, change of the subtropical jet. And furthermore, you can look at the changes in the Hadley circulation uh, for their relation to SST gradients. And these things are all going to talk to each other in some way that has not been fully uh, um, uh, figured out, but is likely to be in the near future. So pulling this back um, to talk about the margins of the convection zone, um, this uh, convective margin theory, which Ben Lintner, who will be here later, uh, has worked on, the up anti mechanism. Uh, it refers to the fact that you've increased the amount of moist static energy at low levels you have to have to keep playing the convection game. Um, the uh, heavy duty poker player here in the center of the convection zone uh, is uh, increasing the ante and kind of uh, um, nudging the uh, um, the player at the margin of the convection zone to fold without being able to uh, convect so often. Um, that has several implications that you can take in other directions in a hand wavy sort of way. For instance, this same competition for um, uh, convecting into a warmer troposphere can happen at the dry to wet season transition so you can, for instance, have an extension of the dry season. There's a number of references down here. For instance, Angie Seth has worked uh, on this um, and Michaela Biazuti, who's here. Um, so the fact that you have to moisten more at the end of the dry season to get your convection going has a time analog to this uh, spatial effect here, all viewed through this lens of the onset. Now let's do a couple of other things while we're at it. Um, Picking off other terms in the moist static energy uh, equation, at this is ghosted out here to remind you that you've seen all the equations at the top before and are fully familiar with the top half of the slide. Um, the next term is surface uh, uh, balances. And this is nice and simple most places, except in the equatorial cold tongue, because if you don't have big changes in the ocean circulation, this will just adjust back to a small value. And the balance of that will give sea surface temperature largely as a byproduct or a diagnostic of the energetic balances that are going into this change. So the sea surface temperature is not causal, but can be an excellent diagnostic. And Sarah Kang, Isaac Held, and others, uh, others have, uh, have had um, explicit addressing of the fact that it's not causal. But Shangping has shown nice examples where it's a very good diagnostic. Um, the top of the atmosphere gets interesting because you can get a spatial pattern from greenhouse gas increase plus the climatological cloud cover, creating a direct forcing of a contribution of the circulation that's sometimes referred to as a fast response. And I'll show you a slide of that in a, a, a second. And then the final point I want to make before uh, leaving this equation I believe forever, um, is the smallness of the gross moistability means that you need a big circulation change to balance anything going on over here, including if you have a, a remote impact on the energy budget, such as you messed with the clouds or the ice cover at high latitudes, and that uh, got transported into the vicinity of your convection zone, you can have a substantial change in the local convergence and circulation, and thus precipitation, so you can actually move an ITCZ uh, with remote uh, uh, effects very easily. So here's the quote fast response, another terminology question. Um, so taking this thermodynamic that has nothing to do with the thermodynamic equation terminology seriously, the dynamic component, which does have something to do with the dynamics, um, but is really mostly forced by the thermodynamics, um, and uh, using that terminology, the top panels here are what happened in the 
first year of a four times CO2 equation in a paper by Boney et al. And there was antecedents for that, this, for instance, in Gregory and Webb. Um, so in the long term, by the time your surface temperature has warmed by four degrees Celsius, you get a substantial contribution just from the part that's diagnosed from increases of surface temperature being assumed to create clausius clapeyron increases in the moisture times the climatological moisture convergence. So that's being brought out here. And here's the part that's due to essentially everything else from a multi-model ensemble. Note the multi-model ensemble again. And that's the dynamic component. They're both pretty big. Notice in, this is tightening up the um, thermodynamic component. Um, this part, the part that's attributed not to warming, is already showing up in the first year. So that's referred to as a fast response. And it's substantial in the subtropics where you're getting uh, infrared transfer getting more or less directly out to space or more directly out to space than in the deep convection zones. And so that's driving a pretty healthy component of the circulation that has its diagnostics in the top of the atmosphere uh, energy budget. Now, Regarding the terminology, um, oh, and I believe uh, that Tim Merlis has worked on uh, things like this uh, just recently as well. So um, fast, if you're used to thinking about biogeochemical cycles, then the term fast is very weird because it's only fast in an idealized experiment where you suddenly get to put in four times pre-industrial CO2 all at once by fiat. If you actually had to dig up all those fossil fuels, use them for energy, put them into the atmosphere, it would take you a couple of centuries, much faster than the ocean adjustment time. So this is a fast component that's not fast. And you would not see this cropping up earlier than this component or this component. They would come up together. But it's a useful conceptual way of splitting things up in that it's driven from a different dynamics directly from the radiative effects. OK, so um, this figure is the one that I showed right at the start with all the processes uh, going on here. And it's a reminder that if you're thinking about the climatology, using the moisture budget all by itself would be, well, I wrote odd here, but weird would be a better word. Um, you would just never get anywhere if you only thought about the moisture budget in the climatology. You would want to think about what the moist static energy is doing at low levels, as Bill argued. Uh, you would want to think about the onset of conditional instability affected by that and the free troposphere. And you would want to make sure for sure that you were balancing your energy budget, um, even if you were assuming that your wave dynamics was spreading things out very fast so you didn't need a vorticity equation, for example. Um, so. One of the things that we should be doing is moving back to the original rich get richer mechanism discussion that included all of these factors in order to tighten up the argument that was giving us sort of a sloppy uh, um, um, spread out figure uh, of, uh, that depended only on the climatological moisture convergence. Or interesting ways of coming at it involve using the sea surface temperature as a diagnostic. Uh, and that's going to be directly related, since the sea surface temperature is affecting the low level moist static energy, is going to be directly related as a diagnostic to where you can get the convective onset going. And I'm pretty sure that Shang -Pi will, Shang Ping will be going, uh, will be elaborating on that this afternoon. So I skipped that. Now, a couple of quick notes that I couldn't uh, resist putting in. Um, one thing is a sort of a shout out to Jia Zhou, who uh, uh, died this past year uh, at a young age and would have loved to be here at the monsoons, monsoon uh, workshop. Um, so this is a diagnostic by him of the net flux into the atmosphere as it looks in current climate. And of course, it has some error bars in it associated with uh, estimates of the surface energy budget and the top of the energy budget. But by and large, what you can see is that in the areas where you have convection zones, you have positive net flux into the atmosphere, although they're not all that big in terms of watt per meter squared. You're ta talking about 30-ish um, watt per meter squared uh, um, uh, in here and 60 in the center of the convection zone over Africa. The land regions by this view look very advantaged because they're getting a lot of insulation and they're not transporting any energy out nor storing it in the ocean. So the ocean is uh, both transporting in the um, summer hemisphere, uh, transporting both hemispheres and storing in the summer hemisphere. 
giving a strong land sea contrast by this measure. But you can also notice that the, the strong positive energy flux into the atmosphere over land goes very far north in the summer hemisphere uh, because the insulation goes very far north, much farther than you actually get the monsoons to go. And that's a reminder that dynamical effects are very important in uh, transitioning you from a tropical type thermodynamic balance, thermodynamic in the sense of actually using the thermodynamic equation, uh, to a balance that involves uh, bringing low moist static energy air from oceans onto the surrounding continent. And I just wanted to throw in one quick diagram that's directly related to idealized monsoons. And uh, Ja had a couple of papers on this uh, for each of the monsoon systems without topography back in the um, early 2000s. Essentially, you're storing or transporting a lot of heat in the ocean. And the big point here is that if you're bringing that air over a continent, it may seem like a moisture source, but actually it's killing convection. The moist static energy that you've got at low levels is much lower than you would need to fire convection over a warm continent into a warm troposphere. And that has a strong effect in limiting the northward extent of the monsoons, including uh, over the African region uh, in the Green Sahara case, as I was mentioning uh, for uh, Jessica's talk, where you can see that the pathway of the low moist static energy air was much more complicated than shown here. Okay. I briefly want to touch on what if you use the same arguments for um, variations that you used for the mean climate just now. And so it's worth touching base. Uh, there's been discussion for a long time. This is back to a review paper in 2000 of how you would shift a um, probability density function, for instance, under global warming, this would be very obvious for temperature, or possibly for precipitation, uh, you would be extending uh, a, I'm afraid my laser pointer is dying here, um, extending it, it towards a, a higher uh, distribution. And one of the ways of talking about this is just from that same moisture balance that we were using before, the precipitation, we're now talking about the total precipitation, is going to be moisture times the convergence at leading order, order plus blah, blah, blah terms that will mess you up a little bit, but um, hopefully uh, this gives you a main effect. If your moisture is increase, increasing by a factor, say, 1 plus gamma, where gamma might be 20-some percent if you have a 3-degree warming uh, just due to the clausius clapeyron factors, um, then you expect to increase your precipitation. And for instance, if you argue that, fingers crossed, the factors setting the convergence in any given storm remain approximately the same, and that's a big hope, that's not at all guaranteed, then you would hope that the precipitation would be increased by this factor, 1 plus the Kaussius clapeyron uh, gamma, so like 1.2, um, for the corresponding uh, storm situation. Then you have a rich get richer effect uh, applied to the variability as discussed by Trend Berth and Paul et al, for instance, that I'll show in a second. And you could even try rescaling the distribution so that your probability of getting a certain precipitation is the same as the current climate, but for a precipitation that's divided by one plus gamma, um, if you're arguing that that should have the same probability uh, under the stretched precipitation um, uh, distribution. So just to pick up a couple of studies um, that have illustrated this, uh, this is from Paul et al, 2007, uh, and we're looking at, uh, note it's log-log plot of the distribution of daily precipitation from the Hadley Center model uh, for the, um, uh, up top here from the end of this century under a um, increased uh, CO2 scenario versus control, and you can do the ratio of those. And you find that as you go out to very high um, percentiles of the distribution, you approach a clausius clapeyron type ratio, which I've thrown on here as a green line, um, just to, for the degree of warming that they uh, have, where would the clausius clapeyron be? And it turns out that if you look in as a function of latitude, um, the decrease at uh, low percentiles tends to be typically a tropical feature, whereas at mid-latitudes, this happens for uh, most percentiles here. And if you look at this uh, geographically, um, you can see the top is the percent change in daily precipitation, the bottom is the change in mean precipitation. 
the subtropical areas where you tended to have a reduction in the mean precipitation tend to be the areas uh, where you actually, uh, um, where, where you don't get these uh, increases in the uh, 99th percentile, whereas most other places you do. And the typical light blue color is about the Clausius clapeyron. So you have some substantial uh, dynamical differences from Clausius, pure Clausius clapeyron effects, but they get you a rough and ready um, uh, view of what's going on uh, globally. And then you can try and do slightly more fancy things to, um, in order to uh, quantify this more. This is another study where, again, you're looking at historical uh, um, versus a uh, distribution of precipitation uh, for historical versus a uh, global warming run. And here's the relative change as a function of the precip here in its absolute values. And as you move up to the heavier values um, uh, of the daily precipitation, you get the relative change increasing by some tens of percent, uh, which somewhat uh, exceed the Clausius uh, clapeyron. And then you can do things like try to define a thermodynamic precipitation change. And uh, if the, the top one is just the column water vapor change, verifying that that's changing at about the Clausius clapeyron uh, uh, rate that you expect. And you're doing this rescaling of the distribution that I argued earlier to define this thermodynamic uh, um, change. And it's doing a not entirely bad job of getting you a leading order effect for the change in what you expect for heavy precipitation, the percent increase, <laughs> percent increase in precipitation. Um, that's that serious feedback there. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, and that's sort of the, eff effectively, the rich get richer applied to extreme events like the one we just experienced with the strong feedback. <laughs> okay, so how do you condense this for climate models? This is um, a, a figure from uh, Silman et al, 2013. Uh, for some of the measures that were set up by, back in, in um, Fritsch et al, um, back in the early 2000s, um, measures that one was going to use sort of rule of thumb, like total wet day precipitation shown, shown here, uh, where wet day precipitation is just any day when you had greater than one millimeter. Um, and you see these changes in uh, sort of uh, tens of percent for the upper uh, scenarios for global warming. In this case, the representative concentration pathway 8.5 is one of the more business as usual scenarios for warming. And they scale proportional to the degree of greenhouse gases that are input in these uh, different scenarios here. And then you can do this for different um, uh, measures like change in very wet days, uh, change in consecutive dry days, and <clears throat> These are each expressed as percent, still from this Silman et al. article. Um, <clears throat> the, da the dots mean not statistically significant. And you tend to find, in, even in the monsoon regions, these changes in increases in the um, uh, dry periods, uh, duration of the dry periods, at the same time as you find the changes in very wet days, although there's considerable variation geographically. So it's not all controlled by the um, closest clapeyron effect, the thermodynamic quote unquote effect, uh, but there's substantial room for dynamical effects from one region to another. And then if you're trying to write an IPCC report, um, this you want the most robust stuff. So you basically quote the figures from the Silman uh, et al article verbatim uh, with these increases, for instance, in the wettest uh, consecutive five days and discuss it in terms of the thermodynamic and uh, dynamic contributions above. Uh, so strong agreement across the models over the direction change and the sort of seemingly contradictory effect, more intense uh, <laughs> raining when you're raining hard, yet longer dry periods, which if you were just looking at the balances we were just looking at, aren't contradictory at all. If you have one, then you have to have the other. So bringing it back still within the two slides of sort of an IPCC type summary of these things, this is uh, listing up a large number of those indices that we uh, just saw, saw examples of uh, shown for the global monsoon region um, and uh, as defined by Wang et al. 2011, these areas that have uh, uh, conditions on the winter precipitation rate and the local summer precipitation rate. 
uh, uh, so this large uh, area average here. And the different color codings are the different increases in greenhouse gas, with red being the largest increase in greenhouse gas uh, through the end of this century. And you find that various of these measures indeed do increase uh, in more or less the expected way when you take these large area averages. So you can be happy with that and go home, finish your port. Uh, but from the point of view of the research uh, that's ongoing, it's necessary to show some of the caveats on uh, these aggregate measures, things that happen at the local regional scale. And I'm going to sh briefly show individual models uh, where the regional changes uh, don't agree so well and briefly show um, parameter dependence in the model for precipitation changes, just to remind us that monsoons can get pushed around a lot by small effects at the regional scale. And that may be particularly relevant to think about uh, for the paleo uh, type uh, applications, where often you have observations from a single site, which is going to be heavily influenced by regional effects. And in that case, I'm going to just be briefly showing two uh, models with uh, parameter perturbations in them. And this will uh, be fairly uh, brief. Oh. All right, so first, recall earlier on that we were looking at global warming changes for the end of this century relative to historical periods, say 30-year averages in each case. And we had been looking at a multi-model ensemble average and uh, uh, annual average. And things had been looking pretty sensible. Uh, the mid-latitudes were getting moister, the subtropics were getting drier, the deep tropics were getting wetter. And one was able to say, ah, it's the rich get richer or, or the updated terminology, the wet get wetter, which is useful if you're a bureaucrat and worried that somebody might un not understand a simple analogy like rich get richer um, <laughs> or, uh, or the um, uh, 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 warm get wetter if you're looking at some of the details. Huh? So this is an individual model for the summertime season, and it indeed has these strong regions of drying. You can see in the winter hemisphere that it has large scale increase. You can see at the flanks of the convection zone that there tends to be a narrowing of the convection, uh, for example, here, here, and here. Um, and some intensification in the center of the convection zones, as well as some changes in the monsoon over here. Um, three millimeters per day and minus three millimeters per day are the uh, um, ends of the resolved color scale, although you're getting above this in certain locations. And remember that the edge of a strong convection zone, four millimeters per day, is a pretty good indicator. So this is totally shutting down the edge of the convection zone here. Um, this is from the NCAR model, CCSM4, uh, in the CMIP5 archive. And it, the, it's, uh, what I'm showing is only from models that have multiple runs, so that when you're doing a 30-year average, it's over, in this case, five 30-year averages, so 150 years worth of end of century versus minus 150 years worth of historical average. So the statistical significance is pretty good. So if I switch to another model, this is the Australian model. You have similar uh, features qualitatively, such as increases in parts of the deep tropics, increases in the winter hemisphere, shutting down some of the edges of the convection zones, but they're not the same edges. And if I move to another model, it jumps again. This is the Hadley Center model. And if I move to the Canadian model, it jumps again. And to a Japanese model, it jumps again. The pattern at the regional scale is not entirely stable. Um, and so the question is, how does this arise? And the thing to blame is those dynamical feedbacks that we were talking about earlier on. There have been multiple di diagnostics of this, including by Richard Seeger, who I think isn't here yet, but will be. Um, so those the, the, the changes in the circulation are what's doing it. But you should always have ch expected those changes in the circulation. Uh, you can't just increase the moisture and expect nothing to happen because it will change the uh, onset criterion for the edge of the convection zone. You'll have to shut down some convection zone somewhere. You have broad scale um, constraints that tell you that you have to uh, um, balance your evaporation, your precipitation at the large scale, but uh, small scale energy constraints that tell you you have to do it differently in different places. 
And so one of the ways of asking about this is, is what's the sensitivity to parameters that uh, within, for instance, in this case, the convection scheme. And so there's this whole little industry that's referred to briefly here of per perturbing the physics of the climate models. This has been substantially done in the context of uh, asking what the global climate sensitivity is, uh, how it changes, what's the uncertainty associated with messing with your parameters. Uh, and here it's being shown in the context of the hydrological cycle. And it's worth remembering that the, um, th this could be a very, very nasty problem in terms of figuring out the parameter dependence of a model because there are many parameters that can affect your solution. And if you have to sample the parameter space densely, uh, that's a big problem. So you care about things like the degree of nonlinearity, which will also affect your strategy for how you um, work to improve the climate models. So this is a quick example from a, uh, uh, the uh, ICTP coupled model, the International Center for Theoretical uh, Physics model coupled to a mixed layer for a doubled CO2 minus pre-industrial case where you have enough parameter settings in, in this case, a convective parameter that affects the firing of convection according to the relative humidity of the uh, lower free troposphere around it. And you can break it into a locally linear and a locally nonlinear con contribution where nonlinear means as a function of parameter. And if you plot that as a function of parameter, you can see that by these measures, it is indeed um, smooth, but substantially nonlinear. And this is an issue for um, how you're gonna constrain this problem. You can get regions that are of the parameter space that are highly sensitive, such as the uh, region where you depend strongly or not on the, uh, on the, um, the relative humidity of the, where, of the air where the convection is going up, essentially the convective onset criterion. So I just wanna show a couple of figures before I wrap up of one of the models that we saw earlier. This is the NCAR um, CCSM4, uh, um, sorry, excuse me, this is updated to CESM1. Um, for this June, July, August precipitation anomaly, very much as we saw before, with increases here in these reddish brownish colors and decreases in these bluish colors, for the end of the century relative to a base period in the historical climatology. And this is the signal that you're trying to predict. Strong reductions of precipitation, strong increases of precipitation regionally in the system. What I'm gonna show next is run this twice with different parameters and subtract those changes from each other. So this is you run with two different values of the downdraft fraction, get two diagrams like I just showed and subtract them. So this is the sensitivity, i.e. this says how much you change that figure we just saw when you mess with the parameters in the convection scheme relative to their standard value. And the color bar is the same, the pattern's different, but the amplitude is as large as the signal you're trying to predict. If you switch to the deep convective adjustment time, you similarly get, and again, this is a difference between two different runs, two different pr projections of global warming precipitation change. So this is the sensitivity to this particular parameter. And again, it's as large as the signal you're trying to predict. If you go to entrainment, the, the sensitivity is even larger. So this is symptomatic of why the different uh, models with their slightly different representations of convection are having so much trouble agreeing at the regional level. It's very sensitive to things that affect the onset of the convection, for, for example. But then there is some good news. It turns out that this is a very nonlinear parameter dependence. If you chop out the severest part of the uh, parameter dependence, which happens to be at low entrainment, this is what your sensitivity comes down to. And one of the things you can do is build up evidence against that portion of parameter space. And if you're able to exclude that from this model, you get a much smaller contribution to the type of sensitivity we just saw, which suggests an agenda for improving the um, projections of global warming or uncertainty. Okay, I have two summary slides. One is just to um, uh, uh, check off all the things that are being done in face of the hydrological cycle change uncertainty. 
Um, one is to uh, uh, focus on effects that depend on temperature, which tends to be more predictable at regional scales, like evapotranspiration or snow melt. Um, one is just only show multimodal ensemble averages so that uh, um, you're not showing the full variation among your model ensemble, but that's always going to underestimate the typical amplitude of the change. Um, and then uh, better is to make statements of the physical processes involved in the uncertainty, so at least uh, you have a clear idea at the regional level of what are the factors coming in. And then, of course, you can wait for uh, you to, uh, us to detect the actual change as we continue with the global warming experiment on the cli uh, climate. But one of the things we might want to discuss within this workshop is how you improve the statements of uh, what you can get from uh, these uh, statements of how global warming precipitation will change in terms of wet get wetter, warm get wetter, or rich get richer, and ways you can wring a little bit more information over that. And then finally, this is just a summary slide for the um, sensitivity uh, statement. Um, it seems that within a model, when you perturb the parameters, it's nonlinear, but it tends to be sensibly nonlinear, relatively smooth, uh, so you have tools to quantify it. And one of the things one should be doing, I would advocate, is identifying the particularly sensitive nonlinear ranges and then finding uh, um, uh, specific constraints to exclude those. Uh, such as the low entrainment range I just discussed.